Hello, this is Roof of the Clan of the Grey Wolf, and welcome again to 16-Bit Gems. There's a good chance you've heard of Game Freak. The development house probably best known for its logo of a troll face whale standing on its side. Ha <laughs> ha! It can't be unseen. Oh hey, and they made Pokemon too. But a funny thing happened on the way to creating the most popular RPG franchise in video game history. They actually made other games. It all started in 1989 when the company was founded by Satoshi Tajiri and took its name from the Japanese magazine Game Freak, of which Tajiri was also a co-founder. They released their very first title that same year, a puzzle game called Mendel Palace. Not exactly a well-known game, or, well, even very good, but at least it got a fancy commercial. A video game fantasy with 20 areas, 200 levels, even a two-player mode. Will you reach candy before something else does? <laughs> they later went on to develop somewhat known games, such as the fairly mediocre but mother-approved puzzler Yoshi, and the Japanese-only Mario and Wario, which is a pretty fun title, but that's another episode. While mostly developing for Nintendo consoles, Game Freak also created a few games for Sega, NEC, and Sony in the 90s, before construction of a Pikachu-shaped money bin took up all their free time. And this is where today's episode focuses, on one of those non-Nintendo games, not the money bin thing. Pulse Man was released in 1994 for the Sega Mega Drive, and it was a Japanese exclusive, at least in cartridge form. It actually was available in parts of North America via the Sega Channel, which was a limited reach cable service I first covered in my Mega Man The Wily Wars review. However, since the mid-90s, this game has only been available in the West via import, at least until it was put up on the Wii's Virtual Console in 2009. As to the game itself, Pulse Man is a side-scrolling action platformer, so you normally wouldn't expect too much in the story department, which is good since most of the text is in Japanese. However, the plot to this game is a bit more intriguing than your standard issue Rescue the Damsel fare that permeated platformers at the time. It tells the tale of a scientist who created the world's most advanced artificial intelligence named Sea Life. But in a sudden bout of dirty old manism, he falls in love with it and uploads himself into the computer where they mix DNA, use your imagination, and make a hybrid baby that can travel between the computer world and the real world via electricity. And that's really the story. I triple checked it. Ew. The scientist spends so much time in the computer world that he goes insane, returns to the real world, and creates a cyber terrorist group known as the Galaxy Gang, which may sound familiar to fans of Pokemon Diamond and Pearl. However, the hybrid baby, who grew up to be the titular Pulse Man, is intent on stopping his evil father. This involves working his way through seven stages, of which you have some choice in selecting the order, choosing first among a group of three stages, then between a second group of three, and finally the last stage. If there are three words that can best describe this game, it's Polish, Polish, Polish. Oh, sorry, uh, misread that. Polish, Polish, Polish. You can tell the Game Freak fine-tuned Pulse Man so that there were practically no weak links, and that's why it still holds up well as a classic so many years later. The first thing that sets this game apart from other platformers is the gameplay. Pulse Man can channel electricity through his body, using it both as a weapon and as a means of quick transport through the power of Volteca, or Volt Tackle, meaning that he can charge his body up by either running a short distance or using a forward dash executed with a quick double tap of the D-pad. Once you're charged up, you can either launch an electric projectile at enemies or unleash the aforementioned Volt Tackle. I'm sure the projectiles are nice and the standard punches, kicks, and somersaults are alright, but the Volt Tackle, which launches you forward and up at a 45 degree angle, will be used to not only barrel through enemies, but also pull off some orchestral maneuvers in the dark. You see, if your tackle hits a surface, then Pulse Man will just ricochet right off it and keep going in the same ball lightning form, repeating the process ad nauseum as long as there are enough surfaces nearby to bounce off of. However, the attack will end if you fly long enough without smacking into anything. Or you just cancel it yourself by hitting the Volt Tackle button again. This is the defining mechanic of the game. You can use it to greatly improve your control of Pulse Man as you work your way past, or through, enemies while hopping to the next platform. After a fairly shallow learning curve, you'll be amazed at how well you can handle these stages, if you're on your toes. Though the mechanics are very different, I'm reminded of how it felt when I first played Mega Man X. 
After years of handling a Mega Man who had all the aeronautical grace of an iron kite, the ability to latch onto and scale walls was an incredibly freeing experience. Pits, though still dangerous, weren't the instant death traps that they once were, and the difficulty could be ratcheted up in ways that didn't involve cheap falls. Through the Volt Tackle, I felt a similar sense of freedom here. You'll be surprised how much trouble you can get out of if you handle it well. And beyond just bouncing around, you can use this power to ride high voltage wires as well, using a bit of Pulseman's epic backstory to flesh out the gameplay a little bit more. It's a way to add a new method of transport that isn't seen too often in games of this nature, and knowing when to hop onto an adjacent line at high speed or just cancel the trip outright will factor in heavily during certain levels. You'll need those tight controls in order to successfully navigate the variety of stages thrown at you. As I said, there are seven stages proper in the game, but that belies the expansiveness of the level design, each with little tweaks that shake up the standard platforming formula. I already mentioned the travel via high-tension wire, but there's also spots that are drenched in water, which obviously wreaks havoc with your electricity-based powers. You'll need to use completely different tactics to get through these stages. There's even repeating quasi-mazes like the one in the last castle of Super Mario Bros., which is probably my least hated form of maze. I'm not sure why, it just doesn't seem as annoying as the hedge maze type puzzles where you can easily get stuck and then have to backtrack. Here, if you mess up, you're automatically dumped back at the beginning, which I can appreciate. The difficulty level of the game is fairly moderate, once you've gotten the hang of using the Volt Tackle. Assuming that, the length is that of a pretty standard platformer of the time, maybe you know, two to four hours on average. Pulseman can take three hits before he dies, as indicated by a color-coded light in the upper left corner of the screen, but there are life power-ups available in each stage. The beauty of Pulseman is that it can be difficult if you just run into it headlong. Taking the time to learn the skills available practically makes it a new game. That shows great design. The graphics are absolutely stunning. Pulseman's actions are varied and smooth, plus there's a lot of nice touches to the design that add to the game's atmosphere. The stages take place in different locations around the globe, and each one somewhat reflects that area. Uh, Alaska is appropriately icy, Australia's Great Barrier Reef is aquatic, and there's even an arcade game in Japan that Pulseman zaps himself into. Every background is detailed and colorful. Sometimes a bit too colorful, depending on who you ask, but I appreciate overdoing it in this instance as compared to the browns and grays that seem to permeate more realistic games of today. This style is more reminiscent of a cartoon or a comic, and it greatly adds to the atmosphere. Add in backgrounds that scroll at differing rates to simulate depth, and you can see why this is a very pretty game for any 16-bit console. Sound is also very good. The music is catchy, and some tracks are even worthy of a listen on YouTube all by themselves. The soundtrack is sufficiently energetic and, again, adds to the game's atmosphere. It passed my test for good video game music when I found myself humming a few tracks hours after I stopped playing. And beyond that, the voice samples are rather amazing for a game of this era. It is unknown if Pulse Man was harmed in the explosion with Gangboss Wadayama. Could this be the end for Pulse Man? Like I said before, the story's text is told in Japanese, but you don't need to worry much about that since certain points are also told through full-spoken sentences in English. And even more amazingly, it's actually understandable. Game Freak went above and beyond with the sound design here, and it just adds an audible cherry to the genuinely fun experience that is this game. Now as I said, this game is available in the West for the first time in years on the Wii's Virtual Console. And it's not every day that you get to see a new, old-school platform game like this. It's no secret that the golden era of platformers is probably behind us. In fact, as of 2002, platformers represented only 2% of video game market share. So when a great game of the genre gains wide release after being hidden away for 15 years, it's a game to be treasured. This has been Roof of the Clan of the Grey Wolf, and there is no reset button.
Well, at least you got some closure. Which is more than I ever got. Oh, you are just your mother all over. 